Ladies and gentlemen, on the morning of Independence Day 1918, in the trenches opposite the town of Le Hamel in France, the American Expeditionary Force was about to be tested in battle. Four companies of Black Jack Pershing's infantry were assigned to an advance for the very first time. The Americans that morning were serving under Australian command under Lieutenant General Sir John Monash, arguably the best field commander of the First World War, confirmed by the comments of his peers and by later historians. Monash was a skillful and innovative leader in a war where many generals were far too often characterised by the casualty lists that accompanied their decisions. The Americans were new to the Western Front. As yet, they were still inexperienced members of an army still forming but they were eager to demonstrate their mettle, and so they would. The Australians, on the other hand, were toughened veterans by this stage of the war. The five divisions of, of the 1st Australian <coughs> Imperial Force, the AIF, had served on the Western Front since 1916, after the Anzacs had been withdrawn from Gallipoli. The Australians had fought on the Somme at Pozieres from Allen Bullecourt, where thousands of their comrades still lie buried. They were volunteers to a man and had demonstrated their value as combatants time and again. They knew precisely what to expect. Battle was joined, a four minute artillery barrage, a swift advance. Monash had calculated the battle would last 90 minutes. It was over in 93. Le Hamel proved to be a sweeping allied victory. The Americans proved their courage and their tenacity fighting alongside the Australians, though at times their eagerness caused them to drive too far forwards into the accompanying creeping artillery barrage. But they would learn, and in front of them loomed great victories at Chateau Thierry, at Belleau Wood and in the Argonne. Ladies and gentlemen, it was the arrival of the American Expeditionary Forces in 1918 in France that spelled the end of German military aggression the destruction of the imperial houses of Germany and Austria-Hungary and the defeat of tyranny. But significantly, the Americans' first engagement was with their Australian allies. Now the question is, the question I'll endeavour to answer tonight, what brought these two nations together to occupy a trench and to be prepared to sacrifice mightily in the defeat of aggression? The Australians were officially for king and country. Australia still formed part of the British Empire and was therefore automatically at war when Britain declared war on Imperial Germany in 1914. The Americans, on the other hand, were fighting to make the world safe for democracy. They were committed to President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, by which he hoped to settle the First World War honourably and to build a peace for future generations. Of course, we might remember that when advised of President Wilson's 14 points as a peace plan, Prime Minister of France, Georges Clemenceau, replied, the good Lord required only 10. But there was nothing in President Wilson's program of 14 points with which the Australians would have disagreed. The diggers were fiercely democratic, having rejected Australian Prime Minister Billy Hughes twice on the issue of conscription for military service. In your country, you'd call it the draft. They were proud of their all-volunteer status and reflected this in the ballot box. They said no to their own government, twice. No to reinforcement by compulsion. And the Americans themselves were unusual among the major allies. They brought no real imperial agenda to the Western Front. Instead, they brought Wilson's determined sense of idealism and a preparedness to ensure that this war was the last. This was a sentiment with which the Australians found themselves in absolute agreement. And as Woodrow Wilson himself has observed, the history of liberty is a history of resistance. In short, in those early morning hours of the 4th of July 1918, Australians and Americans shared deeply held common values, values which were rooted in rigorous democratic cultures and a clear appreciation of the importance of liberty. Aggression was to be rejected and defeated. The future was to be guaranteed for the peace and for material and human progress, which was assumed in both the US and Australia. This was to characterise international future, the international future. 
This was the great hope. Ladies and gentlemen, that was 1918, but we still share those same values today, and we still fight for them tonight in Afghanistan. Now, people will argue the significance of different dates for the emergence of the modern relationship between Australia and the United States. In his address to the joint session of the Australian Parliament in 1996, President Clinton referred to the arrival of the American trader Philadelphia in Sydney in the year 1792. As background, the Australian penal settlement had only been established in the year 1788. In 1792, the Philadelphia had come from the city of its namesake with a cargo of meat for the infant struggling, sometimes starving, penal colony. It had been a journey of some six months. As President Clinton observed, quoting Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, Philadelphia's cargo was, quote, well cured by the time of arrival. Still others, somewhat mischievously, point to the refitting of the Confederate state ship Shenandoah in Melbourne in early 1865, which then permitted the raider to savage American whalers in the Bering Straits for some weeks after General Robert E. Lee had actually surrendered at Appomattox. We'll leave the significance of this date past, but I thought I'd mention it here in the South tonight. <laughs> others point to President Theodore Roosevelt's decision to send the US Navy on a global tour in the year 1908. We celebrate the centenary this year. President Roosevelt was only too well aware of the significance of Asia and the Pacific to future American foreign policy. So the Great White Fleet, the US fleet, docked in Sydney to a tumultuous reception, to speeches emphasising the commonality of interests across the Pacific and to warm Australian hospitality. But the reality is that Prime Minister John Curtin's open letter to Franklin to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in December of 1941, laid the foundations for our modern relationship. As people would be aware, Australia was directly threatened by the Japanese surge across the Southwest Pacific in December 1941 in the wake of Pearl Harbor. Invasion was feared. Prime Minister Curtin wrote in the Melbourne Herald of December 26, 1941, and I quote, Without any inhibitions of any kind, I make it quite clear that Australia looks to America free of any pangs as to our traditional links or kinship with the United Kingdom. End of quote. An extraordinary statement for an Australian Prime Minister to make at that time. Curtin's appeal outraged Winston Churchill in London. It also unsettled FDR. But in the interests of winning the Pacific War, America responded. And Australia became the base for General Douglas MacArthur's initially meagre gathering of forces to regroup. It was on Australian soil that MacArthur uttered his famous declaration following his escape from the Philippines, I shall return. It was Curtin's appeal to FDR that saw the growth of the closest possible wartime collaboration between Australian and American forces in the Southwest Pacific. Indeed, as former Labor Deputy Prime Minister Kim Beasley is still fond of remarking, for the first 18 months or so of MacArthur's command in the Southwest Pacific, he had more Australians under his command than Americans. In the book Touched with Fire by Eric Bergerud, the observation is made of the mutual respect of Australian and American fighting men. The Americans could pay no higher tribute to Australian soldiers than to refer to Australian infantrymen as being the equivalent of US Marines. This wartime collaboration which helped firstly to turn back the Japanese tide in the Coral Sea and at Milne Bay in Papua New Guinea, and then to begin the long campaign which led ultimately to Japan's surrender in Tokyo Bay aboard USS Missouri, set down very solid foundations for our two countries. These were reflected in the ANZUS Treaty, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, of 1951, which still forms the bedrock of Australia's perspective on national security. ANZUS concluded a peace with Japan, but it also began a long period of intense political and military cooperation, which took Australia and the US from Korea to Vietnam, until finally the ANZUS Treaty was invoked by Australia after September 11, 2001, for the first and only time in its existence. ANZUS remains bedrock in our relationship. And as ANZUS governs our security relationship, the Australia-US economic relationship is reflected overall in the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement, signed in 2004. After debate in our parliament, it was carried overwhelmingly 
as it was in the United States Congress. The economic relationship between our two countries is energetic and strong. Last year there was some $10 billion in Australian exports to the US and well over $23 billion from the US to Australia. Investment presents just as healthy a picture. Approximately one third of all foreign investment in Australia is American. The US is our largest country source of investment dollars. About 4% of US foreign investment is hosted by Australia, which puts us on a level similar to Mexico and Japan. Turn, turning the coin over, the US receives approximately 40% of all Australian direct investment abroad. This has grown. At the end of 2006, Australia had over $40 billion more direct investment in the US than the US had in Australia. The Australia-US Free Trade Agreement was an important step forward. And not, while neither Americans nor Australians achieved everything we wanted to accomplish, it's resulted in significant economic liberalisation and substantial returns to both partners on both sides of the Pacific. Now I turn to a reference that Skip made in his introduction. It's true to observe, I believe, that your presidential election has indeed become a global election. There is always interest in US presidential contests, but never before has there been so much interest in the current battle between Senator Barack Obama and Senator John McCain. Certainly the long campaigns for over a year for the determination of the Republican and Democratic nominees, especially the Democratic primaries, resulted in saturation coverage in Australia. In our country, the primary contests were reported virtually every evening on news and radio. There was extensive coverage in newspapers and on the web. American visitors and American expatriates in our country are constantly asked their views of candidates, policies and campaigns. A global ballot is perhaps an appropriate perception, given the significance of your decision as to who will occupy 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington DC for the next four years. Now it's true I concede no president alone can exercise such power that all is made right. But if we remember the significance of great US presidents, from George Washington through Abraham Lincoln to Franklin Roosevelt to Harry Truman to more recent times, it's clear that American leadership can be critical not only in this country, but in the affairs of the world. A brief tour of the Clinton Library here demonstrates that point uh, eloquently. So perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, one day a presidential contest in the United States will not only be global in perception, but global in participation. Just for the record, I'm merely joking on that. At, uh... <laughs> <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, it's common to hear this century described as an Asian Pacific century. And this brings me to the real core of my address to the gathering tonight. In the Asia Pacific region, there is a pressing need incumbent upon both the United States and Australia, as well as upon other like-minded nations, to fashion a regional security architecture which can serve as a framework for discussion of a range of issues which could give rise to long-term conflict if left unexamined and unresolved. In particular, there is a need for a vehicle to permit the United States and China to sit down across the table with other interested parties, ranging from Japan, Korea, through Australia to the ASEAN countries and India, among others, to find solutions to political, economic and social problems which ought not be left to fester. Now, as Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd is fond of saying, in our region of the world there currently exists an alphabet soup of regional organisations. There is, of course, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which brings this part of the region together. There is the EAS, the East Asian Summit, there is the AAF, the ASEAN Regional Forum. And then there is APEC, sponsored and nurtured by Australia with American acknowledgement during the terms of the Hawke and Keating Labor governments, and during the term of the Clinton administration, I should add, to promote dialogue and economic issues, hence the title APEC, for Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. It includes Taiwan as an economic player, for example. But no structure exists in the Asia Pacific region for a security discussion. Now there's every reason to suggest that Americans and Australians working to build new architecture can succeed. We certainly did so after 1945. And for a start, it needs to be acknowledged that a security forum is the missing piece in the Asia Pacific regional architecture. Frequently, corridor meetings at APEC involving defence secretaries and defence ministers 
have been useful discussion points for private conversations on security matters. This even applied in Hanoi in 2006. As well, the United States has shown interest in expanding the six-party talks on North Korea, which appear to have borne fruit, into a regional vehicle for security discussions. The concept has involved five of the Korean Peninsula interlocutors, the US, China, Russia, Japan and South Korea, thankfully leaving North Korea out of this equation, and bringing five other regional and Pacific players, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Malaysia and Canada, into the conversation. Two meetings have already been held in Kuala Lumpur and in New York. This may well offer the basis for an appropriate regional gathering for a security dialogue. The question of the vehicle is almost as important as the issues which would come before it. Not only are there territorial disputes such as the ownership of the Spratly Islands or the tensions in the Taiwan Straits, there are now obvious questions of energy security which loom large on everyone's agenda, especially that of the Chinese. <coughs> In addition, everyone in the region has an interest in preventing the development of a pandemic. We saw during the SARS problem or the bird flu outbreak that an international response was appropriate. Whether it be a tsunami in the Indian Ocean or a typhoon in Burma or an earthquake in China, prompt regional responses can save thousands of lives and lead to a much more effective rebuilding and recovery program for the citizens who are so appallingly affected. And both our militaries have played key roles, I think we can be proud of them both, have played key roles in disaster relief operations in this region of the world. So the need is there, that's unquestionably true, and the issues are self-evident. All that is required is political resolve, and it's here that American-Australian leadership is absolutely critical. This can be achieved through patient diplomacy and careful discussion. It would be a testament to the strength of Australia-US ties to create this new and valuable structure. Prime Minister Rudd addressed this issue of regional architecture in Sydney earlier this month and he said, we believe that we need to anticipate the historic changes in our region and seek to shape them rather than simply reacting to them. We need to have a vision for an Asia-Pacific community, a vision that embraces a regional institution which spans the entire Asia-Pacific region including the United States, Japan, China, Inda, India, Indonesia and the other states of the region. A regional institution which is able to engage in the full spectrum of dialogue, cooperation and action on economic and political matters and future challenges related to security. The purpose is to encourage the development of a genuine and comprehensive sense of community whose habitual operating principle is cooperation. The danger in not acting is that we run the risk of succumbing to the perception that future conflict within our region may somehow be inevitable. At present, none of our existing regional mechanisms as currently configured are capable of achieving these purposes. And the Prime Minister finished by saying, that's why the new Australian government argues that we should now begin the regional debate about where we want to be in the year 2020. Now this may be an ambitious agenda but we should recall President Jack Kennedy's insightful declaration, and I quote one of America's most eloquent presidents, peace is a daily, a weekly, a monthly process, gradually changing opinions, slowly eroding old barriers, quietly building new structures. So ladies and gentlemen, to return to my earlier question about why those young men from the US and Australia happened to be in that trench that morning. Australia alone has been an ally of the United States in every major war which the US has fought in the 20th and 21st centuries. This places Australia in a unique circumstance among America's friends. By way of illustration of this singular status, since 1993 I've served as a delegate and more recently as a board member of the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue. It meets in alternate years in Washington DC or Sydney or Melbourne. Each January there's a dialogue on the West Coast in San Diego, San Francisco and Los Angeles. Tomorrow I'm travelling to Chicago where the dialogue will meet in that city with American delegates for the first time. The Australian-American Dialogue groups together representative cross-sections of Australian and American opinion leaders from politics and government, from business, from the professions, from the media and the wider community. <coughs> 
It's worked effectively and well in, in ensuring that detailed appreciations of mutual interests and common objectives register in our national policy making in both Washington and in Canberra. It is bipartisan, having been endorsed by both Presidents Bush and by President Clinton, as well as by Prime Ministers Keating, Howard and Rudd. The question is sometimes asked as to why does Australia, which has such an exclusive dialogue with the United States in such a close and candid fashion. Others have sought to emulate this without success. The simple answer is that the dialogue represents a conversation between friends. We get along. True, there are issues on which we differ. There are points of disagreement. That's only natural. But overwhelmingly, common interest prevails. What binds our two countries together is common values, an overriding belief that democratic societies, based on freedom of expression, of association, of religion, of tolerance and openness, are vastly to be preferred to any alternative. Now it's for this point that we ought not to lose sight of the fact that these values can be compromised, especially at times of great stress, such as we're passing through at the moment. I refer, of course, to the Long War, sometimes still characterised as the War on Terror. It's in extraordinarily difficult circumstances such as these that the temptation is there to cut corners, to put aside our values in the interests of securing immediate and definite results. After all, lives can be at stake. I'd argue that it is exactly these times that we need to be most rigorous in defending our liberties. The United States Bill of Rights is a landmark document in safeguarding human rights. In our original constitutional deliberations, Australia considered a Bill of Rights. Certain elements of our Constitution, such as the Australian freedom to practice any religion or none at all, originated in your Bill of Rights. International law now seeks to broaden the application and protection of liberties for a global constituency. Ladies and gentlemen, the West will win the long war. We will do so because our values will prevail. In this critical endeavour, we need to be careful not to lose sight of the reasons why we're fighting. But I conclude on this optimistic note. Francis Fukuyama may have been premature in 1989 when he wrote that we were at the end of history and that liberal democracy was everywhere triumphant. But he may simply have been anticipating a future. The Australian-American relationship is more significant and runs deeper than any administration or government of any persuasion. It's deeper than any president or prime minister or any particular issue or challenge. As President Clinton told our parliament in 1996 at a joint session, the great diversity of our ties was born of shared experience and common values. Our pioneers both settled vast frontiers and built free nations across entire continents. In one another, I really believe we see a distant mirror of our better selves, reflections of liberty and decency, of openness and vitality. President Clinton was absolutely right. Our relationship, the relationship between Australia and the US, is based upon essential commitments to liberty that both our peoples simply assume. We embrace and share those values. And in the final analysis, Australians and Americans have been prepared and continue to be prepared to die for those values. It is this measure of resilience and commitment which binds our two countries together. Values cannot be expressed adequately in a treaty, no matter how gifted the drafters might be. Values are expressed in the relationship between our two countries, which is anchored in the relationship between our two peoples. This constitutes the fundamental nature of the Australian-American relationship as we see it tonight. It's been thus ever since our young men stood together in a trench line opposite Le Hamel on Independence Day 1918. It is a source of both pride and strength. It's appropriate, I believe, to conclude with a remark from one of America's greatest presidents, from Thomas Jefferson, who once said famously, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. Our shared future may be marked by optimism and confidence, both characteristic of our two countries and our two peoples. And our shared future as partners for peace should build a new architecture in the Asia-Pacific region, which will simply confirm it. Thank you very much.